There is a wondrous music of the spheres which wills to be heard, and which a few of our deepest spirits will hear. Ah, that's good old Oswald Spengler. Welcome to the Umphalos Cafe, a place, as I've said, apart, detached. Will Durant, who struck it big with a story of philosophy and then went on to write a massive ten-volume story of civilization, touted Spengler as possibly the greatest German thinker of the 20th century. Joseph Campbell, one of those deepest spirits and a genuine giant of the 20th century, read Spengler's Decline of the West seven times and called it the greatest intellectual event of his life. But who has read or even heard of Oswald Spengler today? Personally, I've never met anyone who's read a single line of him. Thirty years ago now, before dropping out of school for the last time, I asked a history professor what he thought of Spengler and his decline of the West. Dated, was all he said. So, faced with either sticking with the formal educational route or chasing truths I felt illuminating every page of Spengler's classic, I chose the latter course. There'd be no Omphalos Cafe had I chosen otherwise. Dour old Oswald also wrote, a century ago now, Today we live so cowed under the bombardment of this intellectual artillery that hardly anyone can attain to the inward detachment that is required for a clear view of the monstrous drama. I like that, inward detachment. Okay, admittedly, Spengler wrote those words with World War I raging all around him, hence the intellectual artillery and monstrous drama, but that doesn't take away from the profound truth. I've titled this video, James Joyce's Ulysses and the Failure of Our Educational System, mainly because the more I ponder over the almost universal Homeric parallel interpretation of Joyce's masterwork, the more I wonder what has happened to our so-called educational system that no one seems capable of asking what seem to me the simplest questions when it comes to such a contentiously misunderstood book. Over and over again the same cloudy conclusions are drawn and no one asks is that all there is to it but games, puzzles, and an untangleable mass of literary and historical illusions? Well, here in the cafe at any rate there is more to Joyce and Ulysses. In fact, He's part of something bigger and beyond what you can possibly imagine, only I'm afraid it's going to take a radical shift in your educational ground before you can begin to plumb its profundities. Anyway, these ruminations were triggered by yet another book review of Ulysses here on YouTube. Now don't get me wrong, the review in question was standard fare and I'm not criticizing it. Done after a first reading by a young woman, probably in her early 20s, studying literature at the university level, it covered all the usual bases, the Homeric parallels, interior monologue, stream of consciousness techniques, the puzzles Joyce was purported to be playing, and the infinite number of historical and literary allusions. The usual stuff, as I say. However, there was a line that for me stood apart from a great many reviews offered. She advised perusing a few primers on Joyce and Ulysses before tackling the text itself, and then added humorously that evidently every literary scholar ever had written something on the subject, and that, bizarrely, it was as if they had all written them together at the same time and in the same room. Now, I don't know about you, but for me that simple observation is yet another devastating indictment of our educational system. And when I say that, another quote comes to mind. It's from Nietzsche, and Joseph Campbell uses it in his phenomenal creative mythology. It goes, The aim of institutions, whether scientific, artistic, political, or religious, never is to produce and foster exceptional examples. Institutions are concerned, rather, for the usual, the normal, the mediocre. Ouch the usual, normal, and mediocre. Incidentally, remember, in a portrait, and then Ulysses, it's only after finishing with his formal education and taking flight to Paris that Stephen Dedalus' own true awakening begins. Anyway, speaking of creative mythology, I quoted from it again in a comment I left below the young woman's review. And in fact, I wish I had it when I was putting together a few of my own videos on the subject of Ulysses, especially my James Joyce's Ulysses, awakening to the wonder. In truth, it lies at the very heart of what goes on here at the cafe, not to mention my often used phrase, Bloom's Day is for the masses, Daedalus Day for the few. And make no mistake when I say Daedalus Day is for the few, I actually mean it in the sense of Oswald Spengler's deepest spirits listening for the music of the spheres. The quote in question went, 
Next, in Ulysses and the Magic Mountain, two accounts of quests through all the mixed conditions of a modern civilization for an informing principle substantial to existence. Wow, reading lines like that is almost dizzying. It sort of knocks you out of orbit. Ulysses as a quest through all the mixed conditions of a modern civilization for an informing principle substantial to existence? What the heck could that be? And how does that fit in with what we are endlessly taught concerning the Homeric parallels, stream of consciousness and interior monologue of James Joyce's masterwork? Is Campbell even talking about the same book? Indeed he is, and in fact, open and check the index of creative mythology for references to Joyce and Ulysses, and you'll find no less than 51 sightings. 51. So my question really is, with everything written and spoken and taught concerning Ulysses, why doesn't anybody mention or consider Campbell's work? Who even reads Joseph Campbell these days, despite the fact that he wrote and even did numerous videos on James Joyce and his work? Joyce's next great work after Ulysses was Finnegan's Wake. Try reading a page of that, or even watching a few YouTube videos as primers for its mysteries. But again, what scholars expounding on Finnegan's Wake mention Campbell, or the fact that Campbell's first published work was a skeleton key to Finnegan's Wake? Why are they keeping that from you, the hopefully curious student? Or can it be that the depths and breadth of Campbell's towering achievement is beyond the scholars, above them, or perhaps more accurately, beyond the scope of the narrow range of their compartmentalized subjects. And if indeed it is, which of course I believe to be the case, then what does that say about our educational system and its relevance to who we are and where we're at today? After all, casting the most perfunctory glance about, who would deny that a quest through all the mixed conditions of a modern civilization for an informing principle substantial to existence, as Joseph Campbell puts it, is precisely what humanity craves for today. However, you don't have to take this just from me. Joseph Campbell himself addresses the issue of our collective educational deficiencies right in the pages of Creative Mythology. Keep in mind he taught at the university level his entire career so he might know something of the matter. The very first paragraph of the book contains this little gem. For in the history of our still youthful species, a profound respect for inherited forms has generally suppressed innovation. A profound respect for inherited forms has generally suppressed innovation. Reading that, I am immediately reminded of Stephen Dedalus' remark to Mr. Deasy in episode 2 of Ulysses. History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awaken, he says. Those are the words of an innovator, one of Spangler's deepest spirits, struggling to free himself from the inherited forms of history, which, as I've been trying to get across, is actually a core theme of Ulysses. Anyway, Campbell has more to say. On page 373, he elaborates with, This blight of the soul extends from the cathedral close to the university campus, before again quoting from Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols. This is Nietzsche. Here and there, I come in touch with German universities. What an atmosphere prevails among the scholars. What a spiritual desert. How lukewarm and complacent. The hard helotism to which the prodigious range of the contemporary sciences condemns every individual scholar is the main reason why the fuller, richer, more profoundly endowed of our students can no longer find appropriate education or educators. There is nothing from which this culture suffers more than from superabundance of pretentious corner watchers and fragments of humanity, and the universities, against their will, are the real hothouses of this kind of stunting of the spiritual instincts. Then Campbell amends, the only correction I can find needed for a translation of this murderous criticism to our own mid-20th century would be a change of the word against to with all. He then goes on to explain, page 374, first, a religious training and coin platitudes from a world as far from the modern as any could possibly be, how blasphemous is that? Next, a so-called liberal arts education by way of lecture courses, seminars and quizzes, week by week. Great books, such as Ulysses, summarized and evaluated, stuffed into emptied heads, 
as authorized information to be signaled back for grades and then the sciences at the outer reaches of thought all taught by sterilized authorities who in those unrecapturable years of their own youth when the ears eyes and heart of the spirit open to the marvel of oneself and the universe were condemned to that same hard helotism of which Nietzsche writes and then he says summarizing there is no time no place no permission let alone encouragement for experience how beautiful is that there is no time no place no permission let alone encouragement for experience so there you go where we're at educationally today however be that as it may this is the Om Fallows Cafe and this place is not about criticism or being against anything as I've said all too frequently life is all there is and when you awaken to that reality it's all a gift the hockey legend Wayne Gretzky was fond of saying don't go to where the puck has been go to where it's going to my thinking our educational system is expert at studying the minute details of where the puck has been however it requires a true visionary to see where it is going a visionary such as Joyce Campbell or Oswald Spengler I suppose in the end that's the aim of my work here at the cafe however the choice remains with you whether to study and attain degrees in where the puck has been and perpetuate what Campbell called the blighting of the soul in the process or perhaps to move in the direction of where the puck is going it's not exactly an easy decision believe me but the whole world with its infinite wonders and mysteries lie out before he or she who would make the difficult choice to follow his or her own individual path anyway let me share with you a few quotes by those who I like to call giants of the human spirit hinting at where the puck is going where we need and hopefully ever so slowly are going as a species in other words listen for a moment to the wondrous music of the spheres here's Oswald Spengler again from his decline of the West I see world history as a picture of endless formations and transformations of the marvelous waxing and waning of organic forms he then goes on I see the drama of a number of mighty cultures each springing with primitive strength from the soil of a mother region to which it remains firmly bound throughout its whole life cycle each stamping its material its mankind with its own image each having its own idea its own passions its own life will and feeling and its own death and then herein lies the great problem set for the 20th century to solve to explore carefully the inner structure of the organic units through and in which world history fulfills itself and the clincher mankind however has no aim no idea no plan any more than the family of butterflies or orchids that's Oswald Spengler and that ties in nicely with a line the universal historian Will Durant wrote which was history is a fragment of biology the human moment in the pageantry of species or as the poet Walt Whitman would put it do you guess I have some intricate purpose well I have for the fourth month showers have and the mica on the side of the rock has or here's British born Zen student and teacher Alan Watts there is simply no problem of life it is completely purposeless play exuberance which is its own end it's all the same folks and all pointing in the same direction this is from Goethe or Goethe or whatever you want to call it I'm always pronouncing things wrong and remember these words were uttered over 200 years ago now he said I am more convinced that poetry is the universal possession of mankind revealing itself everywhere and at all times in hundreds and hundreds of men national literature is now rather an unmeaning term the epoch of world literature is at hand and everyone must strive to hasten its approach or as James Joyce put it I'd like a language which is above all languages a language to which all will do service I cannot express myself in English without enclosing myself in a tradition these are all just fragments of something big struggling towards the light of day listen to the French philosopher Henry Bergson or Henri Bergson this current of life traversing the bodies it has organized one after another 
passing from generation to generation, has become divided among species and distributed among individuals without losing anything of its force, rather intensifying in proportion to its advance. And life is like a current passing from germ to germ through the medium of a developed organism. That developed organism is you and I. Finally, Bergson wrote, this movement constitutes the unity of the organized world, a prolific unity of infinite richness, superior to any that the intellect could dream of, for the intellect is only one of its aspects or products. And here's another Frenchman about the same time, who actually studied under Henri Bergson, Elie Faure. He wrote, Life changes its instruments and its decorations, but never its internal rhythm or essence. Man wears diverse clothes, but always the same heart. And then, I love this one. History, religion, civilization, the conquest of the universe by man, his pathetic creation of God, all this is nothing but poetry. I love that, his pathetic creation of God, nothing but poetry, folks. I could go on for hours, but I'll leave off here, having just scratched the surface of something epochal struggling amidst the seeming chaos of human activity to attain to the light of day. And I haven't even touched on Campbell's staggering development of Spengler's notion of a historical pseudomorphosis, without which nothing in our understanding of Western civilization, its art and philosophy, its political and social developments, truly make organic sense. Wow, that's pretty big, but true all the same. But listen to lines Joseph Campbell wrote on completion of his phenomenal four-volume Masks of God series. Just the title alone should be stopping people in their tracks. Now, by God, Campbell is referring to the psycho-spiritual hub around which humankind's infinitely variable communities revolve. It is always there, but only perceived through the various and evolving masks we, or more precisely, our deepest spirits, our shaman artists, give it. Hence, the masks of God. Anyway, here's Campbell, and I had to find it in this battered old soft cover. For some reason, it's not in my hardcover version. But here he is on completion of the Masks of God. He wrote, Looking back today over the 12 delightful years that I spent on this richly rewarding enterprise, I find that its main result for me has been its confirmation of a thought I have long and faithfully entertained of the unity of the race of man, not only in its biology, but also in its spiritual history, which is everywhere unfolded in the manner of a single symphony with its themes announced, developed, amplified, and turned about, distorted, reasserted, and today, in a grand fortissimo of all sections sounding together, irresistibly advancing to some kind of mighty climax, out of which the next great movement will emerge. That's Joseph Campbell telling us where the puck is going. As he puts it, irresistibly advancing to some kind of mighty climax, out of which the next great movement will emerge if we have the courage, that is. Like I've said, when it comes to James Joyce's mighty book, Bloom's Day is for the masses, Daedalus Day for the few, and the choice, as always, remains with you. Thanks for visiting the Omphalos Cafe, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.